Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. We are broadcasting, live streaming from beautiful downtown Sunnyvale, California, near the beautiful Apple campus. And today, as you might have seen from our promos, we have Family Day on TOS. I'd like to introduce, first of all, Ariana Mavristomos, who's a TOS patient on a very long and interesting journey. And fortunately, we've also got Ariana's dad, Dr. Nick Mavristanos, a very well-respected chiropractor in northern New Jersey who treats patients with thoracic outlet syndrome and I'm supposing has learned a lot through this experience. So sure. hello, Ariana. Hello, Doc. Hi. Hello. Thank you. thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for bending your schedules to be here on time. We really appreciate it. And we think uh, the patients listening are going to really uh, understand and empathize a lot with our journey here. So Ariana, when did you first start having symptoms? So I first started feeling symptoms about 11 or 12 years ago, I was nine years old and it was on and off. So I never really paid attention to it. I had just been given crutches for breaking my leg and um, it started with just kind of tingling down my arms. Did you participate in a lot of sports? Yes, I was a competitive figure skater. I did that for a couple years, like eight or nine years. Um, it was I originally got TOS, I do believe, from an accident that I had during skating, so. Can you describe the accident? Do you remember it? Yes, um, I remember it perfectly. I It was before practice, I was wearing a bracelet and I had a competition that weekend. So I was competing um, in like practicing in my dress, getting ready for the atmosphere of a competition. Um, and I was wearing a bracelet and my mom's like, you should take that off. And I was like, no, it's my lucky bracelet, don't worry. And um, in the middle of practicing my routine with the music playing and like the band on to show that like, I was re like, rehearsing, um, I was doing a move called a heel stretch. Now, God, it's been so many years now, I can't remember, where I'm basically in a split and I was going backwards and I lost balance and I fell and landed on my ankle. And that was the story of how TOS kind of started for me. So it wasn't an upper extremity injury in your case? I'm not really sure. Um, doctors that I've seen aren't really can't really tell if I got it irritated from wearing the crutches for so many months and being so young and relying on them, or if I developed this from possibly flailing my arm when I fell. It's kind of unknown right now. Probably will be forever. Well, uh, it, it is known as as your dad will back up that sometimes if people use crutches in an improper manner, which is hard for young people, that they can put pressure in the axilla on the brachial plexus, which is really just under the skin. So yeah, there is a risk for that. And I think nowadays, uh, for example, my wife had an injury requiring crutches and they instructed her how to use it to avoid that type of thing. So how long were you on crutches total? Did you say that already? Oh, um, I can't even remember if I said that now, but I was on them for about three months and I'm a very stubborn, persistent person. So I was going through like the fourth grade with them, carrying my bags. I didn't really want to ask people for help. Right. Um, so I kind of tried to do everything myself and I guess kind of hurt myself in the process. So about how long after the uh, skating injury did you notice the symptoms in your arms? I'd say probably like a month and a half in, hmm. like into using the crutches on a regular day basis. I'd say that's when the initial feelings started to come. And it would last for like a minute, two minutes, and then go away for the rest of the day or like come back up here and there. But it was never anything that was worrisome to me. And I kind of just thought like, oh, like my body's just like having an ache, like hmm. I'm using crutches. And it wasn't. Did you get, wasn't, oh, did you get symptoms at night while you slept? Um, I realized the symptoms were more when I sat still. So if my arms were down, um, which isn't, I guess, super typical for TOS. Um, right. because, yeah, so my arms were down resting whenever I wasn't moving is when I kind of felt like I was starting to get like tremory feelings or my arm would kind of spaz and I'd have to lift it and like elevate my arm to be able to like get comfortable. It kind of felt so, like yeah. I was out of control. Nick, how long into her symptoms did you start getting concerned and getting involved in trying to figure this out? Oh, before she even had the symptoms, I was watching her resting on her arms, watching movies on her phone. 
and I was telling her, you know, don't rest like that. It's no good for you. Uh, you know, you're going to have issues. And um, I was dad and she was my daughter. So, you know, she just kept on doing it. And like she said, you know, I would grab her backpack and then say, let me take your backpack to the car and you just, you know, get yourself to the car. And she would take the backpack away from my hands and tell me I'm not an invalid dad. I can do this myself. And, and she would carry the backpack and the crutches and go to her car and go to the car. Um, and she was also supposed to have help at school, which she didn't use. So she just did everything herself. And that's, that's her. But the other part that was concerning me was the length of time that she was on the crutches. Um, from early on, I believe that she was on them for too long. And um, I took her to a friend of mine, orthopedic surgeon, and, you know, he agreed. Um, and then I had the reason why we went with the doctor that we were with in the beginning is because she, she used to figure skate as well. And mm -hmm. Ariana's coach pushed us to go there because she would she knew the routine to get her back on the ice as fast as possible. Um, so, you know, it was like a it was like a pull and a string on both ends. You know, I wasn't happy with her being on crutches for the amount of time that she was on. Bones don't take that long to heal. Um, she was scared for the growth plate that the fracture had gone through. Um, and then it just started happening. And then one night uh, she, she comes crying downstairs, dad, my arm, my arm, I can't sleep, I can't rest. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked on her and I had given, you know, there was no relief. I gave her a leave, I gave her Tylenol, no relief, went to the emergency room. Um, we didn't have a good experience in the emergency room. Um, we ended up leaving the emergency room uh, with really no treatment whatsoever. Um, went home, she passed out from exhaustion and then I called up another orthopedic that I was friendly with through work and he prescribed her uh, baclofen and meloxicam mm -hmm. and something and, and the pred and prednisone. And uh, that seemed- which, which makes everybody feel better for a little while. For a little while, then we went on vacation and she seemed to be okay while we were on vacation. And when we came back from vacation, it all got triggered all over again and it never let go from that point on. So uh, let me let me interject here yeah. for both of you. So you're a high level skater. You're working your butt off to be as good as you can be. And you've got a coach and now a doctor who specializes in this type of injury, the, yeah. the ankle injury, but not the upper extremity injury. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you as a doctor and as a father, you're like getting frustrated, trying to get her to see the right kind of person. And it seems like maybe they weren't focusing on the the cause because it was so obvious she had had an injury of her lower extremity. Is that fair? Yeah. And I mean, also, I mean, I asked, you know, my friend up here, I asked him to call, to call up the doctor and, uh, and, and see if she would work with him to take the, you know, take the cast off, take the, get the, get rid of the uh, crutches and he could monitor up here instead of us driving, you know, two and a half hours, you know, to mm -hmm. chop. And, um, she refused to work with him. Now, CHOP is a children's hospital of Philadelphia. It's one of the yeah. best children's that's, hospitals that's in the world. I refused to work with, you know, with a colleague. So at that point, I turned around and said, well, then she's done. And then uh, and you're it. Frustrating. Um, it was frustrating. You know, it was egos that were kind of getting involved where she was the main issue, not, you know, I'm right or, or you're right. Right. Um, and that's it's interesting that in, in the TOS field, we do get some of that ego clash that people become dogmatic sometimes because their interests are at stake rather than the patients. And uh, it's challenging because Ariana's story is a perfect example of how the presentation can be surprising and different. Yeah. But, but we need that elevated sense of um, awareness, which I'm going to ask you this, uh, Dr. Nick. Yeah. You probably see patients with upper extremity pain all day long, but I'll bet you, you see them differently now than you did 10 years ago. I tell you, the major thing that I, that I see differently is how I listen to my patients, not so much what I do. Um, mainly with Ariana, with, for years, you know, she had her arm up because she, quote unquote, you know, gave her relief. 
And um, really until 11 years later when we met you and were re were we reviewing the uh, MRAs and MRVs was the first time in 11 years that she broke down that phrase to when I bring my arm up after 15 seconds, it goes numb and then I can sleep. And I'm like, you're kidding me. N numb is different than relief of pain. So she was exacerbating her, her thoracic outlet symptoms mm -hmm. in a way that she wasn't feeling her pain. And that confused me because I was always looking for a cervicogenic uh, portion you know, like she had two things going on, not just the thoracic outlet, but maybe nerve root irritation or, or brachial plexus injury, something else that was going on at the same time. And there never was anything else. It was just our, my perception of I get relief when I bring my arm up. So, so nobody asked her the right question. Nobody. Yeah. I took her so to... During to, this took time... Her to other, other, thoracic, uh, other, you know, thoracic surgeons and... Yeah. And, and you know, like, that's not thoracic outlet syndrome. She feels better when she brings her arm up. She doesn't feel good. She's right. got numbness, but she feels right. better. So right. it's very interesting how we use that language. Yeah. So Ariana, go back to this time if you can. And what were your emotions? Um, you're struggling with the pain. You're finding the only relief you find is still symptomatic. And your dad's a doctor and he's trying to get you to different specialists. What did you go through emotionally during this period? Um. I think that it was probably the hardest thing that I've ever been through, especially from the very beginning when I wasn't, I wasn't aware of how to be vocal about my feelings and my symptoms, and I didn't really understand what they meant. I was so young. So I think that speaking with so many doctors that initially thought that it was some kind of phantom pain or in my head and then referring me to see psychologists and different doctors. Um, that was really defeating. It was horrible because I didn't know how to show anyone that something was wrong with me when all these tests that I've been doing for years and years were coming up, like everything was okay. Um, it was really hard. It's really hard to balance like life, I guess, being in so much pain. Um, I also was so young, like I don't remember what it was like beforehand, but I know how like debilitating it has been. I wasn't able to go to the movie theater for like five years, like sit anywhere still, like going, sitting at class was horrible. Um, I would have to take a back with in the morning, one at lunch and then two at night to be able to like get through the day or like think I was, cause I don't even think it helped me in the end. Um, it was like very hard too, to explain it and like talk about it. Like I'm very, I'm not the best at talking about it because I feel like I haven't my whole life just because it's hard to, talk about and have people understand things that they can't see. And I could not have a diagnosis. I didn't have anything to prove that what I was talking about was even happening. So I didn't really know how to talk about it. And did I think you, that keeping it. When you would go to see a new doctor, did you feel optimism? Maybe this is the doctor who can help me? Not, at, not for a long time. Most doctor's appointments it reached a point kind of where my dad and I had, and I had an agreement that if it, the symptoms didn't go away, if the pain didn't go away, um, I was just going to live with it for the rest of my life. Like once I started college, I just wanted to be done with all the doctor's appointments and the needles and the injections and the oh. procedures. Um, so it was definitely a lot. Um, I had doctor's appointments definitely when I got a cervical epidural, for example, I think I was like, what, 13? Yeah. Um, I definitely was looking forward to that appointment because I was kind of told that it would help me and that like I have a good chance of feeling better. So I definitely went into that thinking like I'm going to wake up and like ne not be in pain anymore, like be able to go to class and go to the movies with my friends mm -hmm. and have a sleepover mm -hmm. and go to sleep at night. Um, and then obviously that didn't happen. So anything like that, when I got like Botox, just things that were kind of alluded to me that would help, I would look forward to. But meeting a new doctor, I never really felt optimistic because I feel like I was shunned more away by doctors than I was listened to. Wow. I wonder if it was made worse by the fact that your dad is a doctor and was working so hard on your behalf. And it must have been very frustrating for you. Yeah, it was definitely frustrating. I think it was worse because I had a hard time watching like my dad 
and like my parents kind of struggled through this. So in a way it's like, I don't know what life was like before this. So like, I'm like, I'm okay. And like my parents, are the ones that are like watching and trying to figure this out. And like, they're the ones that are kind of in a way like struggling more than I am. Well, it's heartbreaking watching your child suffer and be in pain. You know, it's in our old house, your bedroom was on top of ours and I would hear you crying at night, not being able to sleep. And I was exhausted wanting to go to sleep and feeling guilty for going to sleep because I knew you couldn't. Hmm. Um, you know, that's, it's, yeah. it's, and, and even though you wanted me to stop looking and, and, just give it a break. I never did. Um, I was always looking for something else, you know, to do to try to help you and get you better. And yeah. uh, that's when I ran into Dr. Ward. And <laughs> yeah. how, did, I, how, did, how did you guys first learn about TOS? It's not something you search for. Well, I searched for it on LinkedIn. That was like my last. Oh, you mean in this, do you mean initially or? Initially, I always knew what you had. I always knew it was thoracic outlet syndrome, but I always thought that there was a second component to it because you would get relief when you brought your arm up. And uh, so I was always looking for, you know, something going on with the cervical spine, a disc injury, cervical nerve root issues or damage to the brachial plexus from the crutches, you know, resting under your arms. And, you know, now I'm pretty much convinced that the reason why you developed this was the length of time that you were in the crutches during your growth spurts, where if you're in crutches, your shoulders are forward, your head is forward, and you were nine, 10 years old going through growth spurts with your shoulder blades, you know, rot rot forward, your and your head forward, and you grew wrong. Um, and you know, can, I, to the MRI, can we go back to something you said before, yeah. Nick? Yeah. Uh, when you would would spearhead this and take Ariana to see different docs and you thought it was TOS, but there's a professional relationship and there's a distance with your child you try to keep. So you're not her doctor. How did you feel in the different doctor's offices? Did you bring up TOS? Oh, I did. I did. And, and, um, you know, they would, uh, they would put her through a couple tests, kind of say, well, it's not, I don't think it's thoracic outlet syndrome. And in the back of my head, it was it, it, the difficult part was looking at people that I refer patients to and work with who were telling me no. And I'm in the back of my head, I'm like, yeah, it is. Um, that was that was the hardest part. And then, you know, my family was like that, you know, you, how do you know that that if this is what it is? If everybody's telling you no, why are you so stuck on it being <laughs> drastic outlet syndrome? Because you're Ariana's dad and you're stubborn like her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which was for the better. It's right. Yeah. So I had an experience if I could share with you where yeah. my um my younger one, my son, uh, about three months of age, had a severe respiratory difficulty and brought him into a hospital. Mm-hmm. And uh, I used to be an internist and of course trained in medical school, but as a radiologist for 20 years, that's way in my past. And um they were treating him. He wasn't getting better. And they were, they kept listening to his chest and he wasn't doing what an asthmatic patient does, but they were treating him for asthma or bronchospasm. Um, They were giving him medications, puffers, inhalers, nebulizer. But I kept telling them, I kept telling the docs that rotated through this pediatric ward, he doesn't have an expiratory wheeze. He's got an inspiratory wheeze, which is one thing for our viewers watching us. It separates what's in the chest from what's outside of the chest. And I didn't, I didn't push them hard because out of professional respect, you know, I didn't want to be a jerk, even though it's my son, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and for two, two days, two full days, I just kept saying it, but I didn't push. I didn't say, can we please discuss this? Please tell me why I'm wrong. And then one day, just fortunately, one of the docs rotating through said, you know, this is not an expiratory wheeze. It's an inspiratory wheeze. And sure enough, there was a laryngospasm. And they gave him steroids and bang, he was he was better. And thank God, wow. you know, just yeah. like thank God Ariana's doing so great now, right? Knock on wood. Yeah. And from my point of view, thank God, my, my child. And I've kicked myself that, you know, next time, it doesn't matter if I look like a jerk. You know, yeah. next time I need to stand up there. And for our patients who are viewing, Many of them have been through this, maybe not as long as you, Ariana, but when I first 
started doing TOS, we saw plenty of patients that were 20 years into this. Yeah. You know, regular, ordinary people. And they, they were depressed. They were emotionally overwhelmed because doctors, yeah. authority figures had said, well, it can't be TOS because TOS is rare. Or it can't mm -hmm. be TOS because I tested your, your pulse and that's it. Um, so I say that because I'm, I'm feeling this from both yeah. of you. And what I want to do is, you know, we're always talking here, we're raising awareness. We're talking about details and diagnosis, but you two are here partly for inspiration for those patients maybe now who are struggling. So how do you feel now after having been through that? Two things. How do you feel, first of all, Ariana? Secondly, Doc, how do you feel that she's better? And what would you change if you could go back? Um, now I feel relief. Definitely. Um, I haven't slept as well as I have now since before, or since I, I how I am now, since before I got thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, I just came back, I was able to fly in a plane and I didn't have to sit in an aisle seat or like get up every like 10 minutes to like move my arm and move around. Um, sitting in class is getting easier. Like my studies are getting better. I just feel like overall, like much happier as a person because I think there was always a part of me that was like somewhat bitter just because I didn't know why I was in pain for so long and like why I couldn't find help and why I couldn't really find someone who would put the time in to help me. But it has definitely changed my life. And I know the surgery doesn't work best for everybody, but it definitely worked so much better than I ever could have imagined. And uh, shout out to your surgeon in New Jersey. Yes, Dr. Ignatius. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you, Dr. Worden, for showing me the diagnostic test that led me there. And Dr. Ignatius is at what uh, institution? Um, uh, Holy Name Hospital. Yes. Sorry, say again for me. Holy Name Hospital in Teaneck, New Jersey. Holy Name Hospital in Teaneck. Good. We, Nick, hopefully you can hook me up with them. I'd love yeah. to talk with them. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, Nick, what did you go through now, and what would you change if you could go back? If I can go back, I, same as you. Just I would, you know, not really care about ruffling feathers and just stick to my guns and and push harder. Um, early on, you know, that's where I kind of kick myself. Is it, it took me too long to get frustrated with the, uh, you know, the doctor that had originally kept her in the crutches for as long as she was in, and maybe she wouldn't have had to go through all of this for so many years. Um, so like, you know, with my patients, when, you know, when they have, when they're in crutches, I, I drill into them, you know, as little as possible and don't let them rest under your arms. And I work on their posture and uh, mm -hmm. so many different things. And then other doctors that were, you know, I took it to so many people that, you know, some people didn't bother examining her and, they're like, you know, it's what I do. So when you're ready, just call me and then I'll, I'll you know, I'll remove her ribs. But you didn't touch her. You didn't, you know, <laughs> you don't know what's I wrong. Don't, I don't think I regret anything because like as bad as it was, I also think that it totally like brought me to where I am today. Like now I'm finishing or I'm in my senior year of college. I'm studying to be a physician assistant, which my medical field inspiration was from having TOS, but it wasn't necessarily because of the pain or anything, but it was more because I always felt like I wanted to be the doctor that I never really got in all wow. the years, someone would, that would listen to me and would take the extra time and go the extra mile just to try to help. You will be. Yeah. Thank you. I hope Can I so. ask you now, how did you guys get from a diagnosis to making a decision on surgery, which is a big deal, especially for a young, healthy woman? Um, it was actually really hard for me to decide whether or not I wanted it. Um, I got diagnosed here at school at University of Florida by Dr. Harvey Chin, like officially first time it was ever written on paper. Um, and right away he was kind of like ready to go into surgery, which I was really excited about initially. Mm -hmm. And then I started joining these Facebook groups, which huh. was the worst thing I've ever done for myself in my entire life because I remember staying up one night like with my roommate, like I was laying in bed and I was just scrolling through like every single post and there was not one thing.
that was positive. Everyone was very depressed, very hateful of the world and of life. And it kind of made me like take a step back and think like, I can't get any worse. And if I end up like these people, like, I don't know if I'm going to be okay. And that was really hard. So I backed out of surgery then because I also was by myself here in Florida. My family's in New Jersey and I was really scared of going through the recovery by myself. Sure. sure. Um, so then I was kind of like against surgery. And then I guess, honestly, like once we started speaking and I went through the proper diagnostic testing and just kind of was struggling through last year a lot. I was really depressed. I couldn't really use my hands that much. We also went through a fast forward where you had no choice. You were waking up yeah. with your fingers closed, not having to peel them open. You you couldn't. Yeah, last year. You, my you, couldn't, you couldn't study. You couldn't do anything. Yeah. So yeah. My symptoms. Yeah. Choice. They progressed a lot last year, kind of from like zero to 100 within like a month. Um, right as I started to come back to school, I, my hands would get stuck, closed. I would have to rub, run them under like warm water. I thought I was developing like early arthritis. Lord. Um, and I couldn't brush my hair. I couldn't really hold like type, hold pencil. Like my grades were dropping and I was just really depressed because I was in so much pain. And I wasn't doing well in school. And I just kind of felt like my life was like slipping away from me. You know, I, I'm going to touch on this briefly. Number one, um, total empathy. I, I can't imagine how strong you are to have gotten through this. What, what challenges? Um, the social media thing is uh, something that I deal with a lot and I try not to talk about it too much, you know, but I wonder if the people like the moderators, and I know these Facebook groups you're talking about, I visit them occasionally and patients contact me about them and ask me why. And I wonder if whatever ego boost they're getting out of being a moderator and bad mouthing the people they don't like, seems there's a lot. Yeah, it was all negative and hateful. And I wonder if they realize the effect they have on so many other people. They've got several thousand, I think the largest group has 9,000 or more members. And I, I wonder if they take any responsibility for that. They're not doctors, they're not medical people at all. And they form their opinions without the medical literature and without knowing what happens with patients. You get a patient on there who says, I had a bad outcome from surgery. Maybe that surgeon did a thousand surgeries and one out of a thousand didn't get the result. But they don't yeah. they don't know that. I as a doctor don't know that because of patient privacy. But they'll form yeah. an opinion on it, and it's become political. And and so I'm sorry for your having gone through that. And I, I, I just wonder if because of all this extra work you were doing at school, if that just really cascaded everything to this point where your your hands were closed. Do you think it was because of the Definitely. extra workload? It definitely didn't help. Um, I find that whenever I do start to get back into the rhythm of school, like after summer, after working, that just sitting at a desk always makes my pain get worse. So it's typically worse during the school year. So So when you're sitting at a desk, you're using a laptop or another device? Laptop or writing. I like to handwrite. So So now um, your, your symptoms are cascading and getting worse and you're depressed from outside influences, and you have a doc who says you should have surgery, and you're saying, yeah, I have an option here. I have something that's going to make me better, and then you stop. How yeah. did you turn that around? Did your dad help you? What Did it just happen to you that you changed um, your mind to get back into this big decision? That was when I found you. Yeah, that's honestly when I changed my mind because I, I wasn't going to get surgery. I was just going to leave it and Oh. Hope it didn't get worse. And I talked. I found you on LinkedIn. And, we communicated. Yeah. I, yep. I, I tagged Ali, uh, Ariana on, you know, to read about you and look into the tests. And and it was what you said to me on the phone that day. I remember I was in the library and I went outside and it was the first time we ever spoke. And um, you told me that the people that are on Facebook aren't going to be the ones that are living their life doing better because those people are outliving their lives. They're not going to be posting about it on Facebook. Um, whereas it's just everyone else that isn't really doing well, or it's just all the negative is right there because that's and, their focus. And we introduced you to a bunch of specialists, right? Yes. Give you these options for people who know TOS, real yes. professionals. And so with your dad's help, you just charged mm-hmm. into that, right? Mm-hmm. 
yeah, it went um, really, really fast, actually. I was flying from Baltimore to New York, to, and I was going to Orlando to go to meet with different doctors. And um, finally, we like kind of, I don't even know how fast we scheduled surgery. It was in, within like two weeks Can of my test to, results. I don't want to skip over this part because it's you had very good experiences. Do you want to share some of the docs you saw and how the experience went with those docs? Um, yes. So I went to see, his name is Dr. Gene Orlando. He was great. Very, very kind. Um, That's Fareed Gargoslu. Yes. yes um, it was a very good appointment. He was kind of explaining to me more about TOS and like what it is and how it became to be TOS and how it's not really just one um, disorder, one group of issues. It is a multitude that kind of got grouped together years and years ago and kind of telling me that it's not just me, like there's a lot of younger people that have it. It's not really an older disease and it's kind of calming my nerves, which helped a lot. Um, but then again, of course, I still wasn't really set on getting the surgery in Florida or proceeding down here just because my family was up north. Um, so then we went to go visit Dr. Lum in Baltimore. That's and Yin that, Lum, who's been a guest here for us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, his approach was that he wanted me to get um, some more Botox, which I'd already gone through a couple rounds a couple years ago. And the pain that I was at at that point, I was, I didn't really, I wasn't like okay with going through that again. I didn't know how my symptoms were going to be progressing a year from now after a couple of rounds of Botox and seeing where it goes. I just didn't really have that time with school and just with trying to like get on with my life. And so I also, um, so then I was just kind of nervous and like, I was like, I don't know if I do surgery, do I do Botox? So then that was kind of a back and forth again. Um, and then finally we met with my, my surgeon now, Dr. Ignatius, and he like explained to me the surgery, how he was gonna do it, kind of like talked me through the whole procedure. Um, and then something in my head just clicked and I was like, it's kind of now or never, this is the best time for me to do it. And I'm just gonna have to hope for the best. And your right side was done first, correct? Left side. Are you right-hand dominant? Yes. So why did you select, or do you know why Dr. Ignatius suggested <laughs> left side first? Well, my left side was always the bad side. On the right, I didn't really experience any symptoms of TOS. Like I would here and there, they would come and go, but like nothing compared to the left side. So that was the first thing that had to be done. And then also because my symptoms were so like minuscule on the right side, I didn't really want to risk mm -hmm. doing anything to my dominant hand. So I was right. like, we'll see how the left side goes and then go from there. And then after I got the left side on my rib removed and a bit of my scalenes, um, I started to feel the symptoms a lot worse in my right side. It was like overnight. And that's when I called him up again. And I was like, Dr. Ignatius, let's schedule me for my right side. He wasn't surprised that the symptoms started becoming aggravated on the right. No, not at all. I initially, I was like, my thoughts were like, oh, maybe we'll just get them both at the, done at the same time, like save the PT, save the double surgeries. And then he was like, you're nuts. We'll talk to me after the first surgery. <laughs> That's uh, so uh, Nick, how did, word, word. <laughs> Nick, what did you think when she had the first surgery and then the symptoms started becoming aggravated on the right? I mean, I wanted her to have it done as fast as possible, you know, to not have the severity uh, or, and nerve damage, you know, go on the right side the same way that it was on the left. So I, went, I, was, I was pushing to get it done as fast as possible. And eight weeks after the first, she had the second. Um, and um, thankfully, you know, he did a wonderful job and she re she's recovering well. She still has some symptoms on the left side, but nothing to the degree of what it used to be. And her life is just. And her life is back. Yeah, she can mm -hmm. she can stand up with both of her arms at her side that she wasn't able to do for, you know, eleven years. Uh, she can sleep at night and have her arms down and not her arm up over her head on a pillow. Um, 
she's not pe calling me up crying that my hands my hands i can't type I have to peel my fingers open in the morning um and we also had like i don't i kind of don't, don't ask her so much because when she was younger and she was in a lot of pain we developed like an in-house rule or she developed an in-house rule that after six o'clock if she doesn't bring it up nobody asks because she didn't want to be reminded of the pain and then deal with it for the rest of the night so uh there are times i still want to ask you how you're doing but i don't do it because i have that like ingrained in me <laughs> i wait for you to ask me total yeah. empathy huh? yeah it's not easy it, it's it's uh it was hard during the time she was considering surgery how how were you feeling um i was very optimistic you know uh, i had a lot of confidence in dr ignatius you know with his work and with and and doing the surgery he's very confident but go back before that yeah he was telling us she was in school and uh dr chin had suggested surgery but then for a lot of reasons she backed off how were you feeling during that period i, I was i i i didn't want her to have it down there because we live in new jersey and then and it, we she would have had to deal with the recovery mostly by herself and i know it's a major surgery and i knew that she wouldn't be able to do it by herself um it's something but that you were needed, right <laughs> it's something that needed everybody to you know pitch in and, and help for i actually have a feeling she could have done it by herself she probably could have but it would have been very very hard yeah but she's ariana yeah and and i mean from a little kid anything she wants to do she does and even in the pain that she was in for all these years she her grades when she says her grades suffered, they, they barely suffered. She's a great <laughs> student. She's a hard worker. And uh, I give her tons and tons of credit for doing all that she's done with the amount of pain that she's in all of her life. I'll say this. Yeah. <laughs> One of the perks of this program for TOS is that we take pride in our kids. Yeah. So Ariana is one of our kids. So everything good <laughs> she does from now on until she gets her first Nobel Prize. So we'll take you know, <laughs> note of everything. Um, so that's great. You, you definitely, from the beginning, Nick thought surgery was the pathway, even when she was doubtful. It was, it was, it was. She had to do it. She had no choice. Well, she didn't think so. So, how did you deal with that emotional? I pushed. You know? Okay. I, I I pushed and 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 um, I talked to her and I told her, I said, you know, that your symptoms are getting worse. You have to peel your fingers open. Circulation is get is 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 suffering. Nerves are going to suffer. You know, do this now so that so that you can recover. You know, and and not have permanent nerve damage. Um, I yeah, I, I really talked to her a lot about about going through with it. Yeah, and I was very resilient for a while too. Yeah, I was like kind of upset. I was like, it's my body. Like, I don't want to get ribs removed. I'm nervous. Like, I just needed to make sure that the choice was like 100% mine yeah. and, before you know, I made it. And from my from my work, you know, surgery is always the last the last option. If you do everything else, but we did everything else. I guess she, that's why I was always so like, it was hard for me too, because growing up, I'd ask you like, I'd have days where I was like, can I just go get like my arm chopped off? Like, yeah. I just want it taken off. Like, I was begging to get surgery when I saw a physician like eight years ago when he didn't even see me. He was like, I'll, I'll do it. And I was like, let's do it. And um, he was well, always telling me how surgery is always the last resort. So then finally, I think when you're telling me like, there's no other choice, like you are getting surgery and it's like now or it's in two months or it's in one month, but it's happening that kind of made it a lot more real and a lot scarier. So your first surgery on your left side, you had some bumps in the road immediately after surgery, right? Um, well, actually my left side went pretty well. I had a lot of pain um, the first week. I guess like I didn't, wasn't given anything to deal with the pain oh, really? um, okay. when I was in the hospital rather than Advil and Tylenol. And that was really bad for me just because I couldn't breathe and I couldn't move. I couldn't talk. So like the first two weeks I was kind of stuck on my couch. Like my parents were working. I have a cat and like me and him hung out and got to know each other very well. Like it was very rough. Um, but then after like two and a half weeks hit, 
it was like I got up again and I could start walking again and everything was fine. I didn't have any chest pain. Um, everything was pretty good. But my right side that I got done in May, um, I ended up having a slight pulmonary embolism. I didn't know that. Um, and that's when mom took me to the hospital. Uh, one day I thought I was dying. Mm -hmm. I couldn't breathe. I was having chest pain for weeks, like after surgery. I still kind of do sometimes, kind of depends on the weather, which is weird. Um, but that was difficult. So it was like hard to breathe. I had labored breathing, shortness of breath, just from like sitting without any exertion, talking. I couldn't really get through a sentence for like a month, I would say. But then after that, everything started getting better. And now I don't have any symptoms on my right side anymore. And I have minimal symptoms on my left. If anything, it's more posture related now, probably than anything. But yeah, the right side is now doing better. Awesome. Do you, would you all like to take some questions? We'll see if we have some questions from the audience. Yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. Herb, if we would. Michael Ann Taylor. Has anybody heard of a child with arm pain plus other symptoms that mimic diabetes or dehydration, but aren't diagnosed with anything for five years? Um, this is kind of a broad question. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to remind our viewers that we don't make specific diagnoses here for any of your questions. We're glad to talk with you if you contact us through our website, but we can talk in general terms here. Um, Arm pain, unfortunately, I mean, this is something that Dr. Nick deals with all the time. Upper extremity pain is very common, and there are just hundreds of causes of it. So, uh, Nick, how would you, if someone comes into your office with arm pain, what's a basic template you would use for assessing and narrowing things down? Uh, well, it can come from so many different places. Like you said, it can come from the cervical spine from a disc injury. It can come from thoracic outlet syndrome. It can come from pec minor syndrome. Uh, it can come from many different places, but the one thing that caught my attention was the dehydration where um, electrolyte imbalance can cause muscle cramping and pain as well. So uh, that's something that is easy to fix and then see what you're left with after that. Um, and I don't I know. Diabetes unlikely to cause neuropathy until you're older, not in a child. Right. Right, but the dehydration definitely can cause muscle cramping and, and, and pain. Is there a second part of this question, Herb? The pain is worse when playing sports. Started in the elbow, moved to the shoulder and scapula. So, of course, Nick, one of the things you deal with is musculoskeletal injuries, sprains, strains. Yeah, and usually the pain doesn't... doesn't um, go from it usually doesn't go from the elbow to the shoulder but people sometimes think it goes that way when it actually goes from the neck to the shoulder blade and then down the shoulder and down the arm and that's usually due to uh you know a nerve root uh issue from either a disc injury or just irritation of of cervical nerve roots um but it, sometimes people feel it in their arm first and then they think it works its way up when it actually goes goes down so you generally, when you see a patient, you try to find the most proximal possible spot of a nerve impingement. Yeah, and then work my way down. And sometimes people have two things. They can have yeah. you know, ulnar nerve entrapment and a cervical disc injury, or and, and one magnifies the other, and you work on the right. neck, and then the other one decreases by itself. So that's great. So you said start proximally and work yeah. your way down. Yeah. Okay. What did you feel when, when Ariana had the development of her pain in the right? We touched on this little bit before but when she developed on the right what do you think the causes are why it was minimal before that but all of a sudden became very apparent uh, that's a tricky one you know it, it's uh sometimes you know when people have a lot of pain in one area they don't realize how much they have in another and then you fix one and then you feel the other more so it probably was at that degree all the time but the other was so severe that she didn't pay attention to it right that's definitely another, possible. Another yeah. possibility is, man, she had years of pain on the left. Now she's feeling better and she's way more active. Right. We, we see this actually a lot, Ariana, in TOS patients. They get one side done and all of a sudden the other side starts showing up. And that's a question we don't have answered and I'm not sure 
if it will be easily answered. Uh, because like, as your dad said, sometimes you're just, you're masking the pain on one side because your brain is so focused on the other. Yeah. You would brought up botulinum toxin before Botox. I just read a paper today about a, it's a review, a recent review of Botox in all the literature and your choice was wise. Uh, for short-term pain relief, Botox can help, but for long-term solutions or as a diagnostic test, which people use it for, the literature in this review article was very mixed. So not tremendously uh, supportive. So yeah, I've done so much research on the Botox, on physical therapy, acupuncture, just like everything that I have done or things that I was even considering in the future. Like now I'm actually considering Botox, but into my traps to help alleviate some of the tension and tightness that I feel like I've been getting since the surgery. Do you have trigger points? Has somebody diagnosed you with trigger points perhaps? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, in it's the past. She still has the the upper cross syndrome, the you know from the thoracic outlet syndrome, and with all the studies that she has on a laptop, and you know she just doesn't have good posture now. So it's the forward rounded shoulders, the forward head carriage, uh, where in the past before the surgery, she couldn't correct her posture because it triggered the pain. Um, now she just has a lot of studying to do, and and isn't really working on her posture too much. Yeah, um, great point. You know, now she now she can do you know the rehab and the exercises to correct her posture and hopefully make a difference to uh, alleviate the uh, the pain that she has in her upper traps by creating a balance with the other musculature. Absolutely needs to focus on that. So Dr. Nick, you brought up a great point. So people who get into these bad postures, their muscles are at a disadvantage right. mechanically. They're not the length they should be, and the muscles react. Yeah. And then, then the nerves react as well because they're constantly firing to activate the muscles. So it becomes a chain. Right. And unfortunately, a neg uh, positive feedback, you know, vicious cycle. Yeah. So, yeah. So are you doing anything in that regard, Oriana, physical therapy or having your dad take you to Cancun three times a year? <laughs> sort of therapy? So actually, it's kind of interesting. After like three months after I got my left rib removed, my dad tried an ultrasound on me, which actually, stim. or electric stim, I'm sorry, which actually triggered the pain, which was really interesting. For a while, actually, like a couple of weeks, um, my pain had gone from like a two to like a four and a half, five. Um, so then we took a break from any kind of physical therapy rehab, just wanted to let everything kind of settle back down again. Mm -hmm. And now I have not started anything. Okay. But, but you're still studying just as hard. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately enough. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, we did the electric muscle stim three times. The first two times were fine. And the third time, it just triggered her pain. Can and, you define um, for our viewers how you do that and what the result is, how it works? Yeah. Um, the way that I was using it on her was... Um, in a, in a method to relax her upper traps and get and and um, and uh, stimulate the middle traps to get them to function better, um, which, like I said, the first two times we did it, you know, she was nervous, but there was no pain and it worked fine. And then the third time, it just triggered her pain for some reason. So I said, okay, you know, no more electric stim for you. You know, we can still do ultrasound where there's no current. We can do laser laser light therapy. Um, and you can still get adjusted and get do exercises and rehab, but you know, as far as electrical current, you know, right now her nerve, her nervous system, I guess, was just too sensitive for it. Okay. Um, Makes sense. I had also tried a new, a new uh, machine which I was demoing on her um, with a, it's a, it's a, a pen type of electric muscle stim that you, it's supposed to decrease pain, and uh, I mean that didn't work for her. Uh, but you know whatever I could get my hands on, whether it was something I was I was trying out and and learning how to use myself at the, as a first time on her, or something that I was using every day in my office, whatever I could get my hands on to help her, you know, I always always try. What can help uh, some patients, Ariana, with this kind of a uh, recovery is the Pomodoro technique. I I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, I yes, think Pomodoro. I have actually. Is, you know, good. So take breaks, get a timer. You can get a software timer on your computer. I use yeah. one myself. Uh, I've found personally, it helps me focus when I only have a few minutes left in a 
20 minute slot, but also forces me to reassess and, and lean back. I'm mm -hmm. always in bad posture on a laptop. They're impossible machines. You can't be. Yeah. You can't have good posture on a laptop. Yeah. yeah. We have another question here. Herb, if you want to put it up. Laura is asking us, did you have nerve pain in the side of the neck or the collarbone? So you want to describe your pain, your symptoms? Yeah. Before surgery? So my symptoms were and still kind of are like I get this pain that starts kind of behind my ear and it would go down my shoulder, kind of on my collarbone, right on top of my collarbone. I had tightness um, in like underneath my collarbone and then it would radiate down my arm into my pinky finger and my ring finger. And, and also down my scapula as well. Was that uh, in the muscles around the scapula or did it feel more like the tingling numbness of a nerve pain? Um, I kind of, it was more of like a throbbing sensation. I always felt like I had like a heartbeat in my back. Mm. So I don't, that's always how I described it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for the question. So, uh, tell us a little bit about your your goals for the uh, short term and long term future, if you would. Um, TOS wise. No, I mean, school wise, life wise. Oh, okay. So, um, important things. Well, right now, my short term goal is after this, I'm going back to the library. I have some exams this week, and I want to finish the semester off strong. Um, I'm going to finish my senior year this year. Um, hopefully all my classes will be done in the spring and then I'll be working. Um, I work at Women's Care Source right now as a medical assistant in Morristown, New Jersey. So I'm going to be continuing working there for two years, gaining experience and saving money, also paying back some of my student loans <laughs> and kind of um, enjoying my life a little bit before I re start reapplying to schools. Um, I want to go to PA school. Um, probably in Manhattan area, New Jersey, right. where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And I I know I should go into thoracic surgery because it's been my entire life. But I think that's also why I'm not like ever really like truly considering going into it. Just because I feel like it was my entire life. And now I kind of want to move on to like a yeah. happier side of medicine. I like OB a lot. It's really nice. Um, so we'll see kind of after I go through my rotations where it goes. That's great. But it will be PA school. Awesome. And you'll obviously keep us well in the loop. Oh, oh yeah. definitely. <laughs> cool. So uh, first of all, I want to thank you both for your time. Um, thank for you. Me, for me yeah. as a doctor who sees this thing and as a dad, you know, I'm, I'm empathizing with both of you. And all the stuff you went through, you know, um, it, it's very hard to have a, a knowledge base of a, of a doctor and to sit there with your child and uh, struggle through this. So I'm glad that you guys did what you did and persevered. And I'm glad that we got to meet you. You know, we're not always sure how yeah, many people we're, are just, we're we're just as happy. And yeah, me too. The, I mean, the one thing that, that I guess needs to be stressed is to never give up. Yeah, because I definitely had my times where I did, and you didn't let me, and no. now we're here. Well, I think Ariana's the type who doesn't give up, and she got that from her parents, right? <laughs> definitely my dad. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so um, hopefully we'll have you back as a, a guest again soon. Uh, thank yeah. you, you know, yeah. for such a well-spoken young person. It's thank great. you. I'd love to be back whenever. This is it, it, It's great because I never really talked about it, so it's nice to know that talking about it is not only like helping me kind of – realize what I've been through and what I'm going through and how everything's okay. But also um, I'm glad that I can help other people because I never really thought that anyone else went through anything like this. That's awesome. Uh, you're on the other side of that long tunnel and uh, yeah. we're so glad for you. Really, this is what makes this Thank thing uh, so special that we get to see people really make this progress. So for you and your whole family, it's, it's just great. Um, oh, yeah. I'm going to speak to our viewers. Everybody, please hit the like button. That's a big part of this algorithm that helps us grow. Please subscribe. We're trying to get to 1,000 subscribers. I know Kim Kardashian has a few more than us. 
but you know, dealing with TOS is a little smaller market. So uh, really helps us if you uh, subscribe to us. There's a bell by the subscribe button. If you hit that bell, you can set it up to notify you every time we do something new. But we also have on toseducation.org a mailing list you can sign up for. So we'll keep you alerted to new stuff. Um, TOSMRI.com is our website, as you've seen on the bottom of the screen. We have a contact us button right on the front page. So if you have questions, just reach out to us. No question is too simple, too easy, too hard. We'll get you to the right people. And um, for our viewers, thanks again for attending. Again, I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy, and uh, we'll see you real soon. Thanks, Dr. Nick, and thanks, Ariana. Thank you. Thank you.